Your Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. We are honored to provide a short virtual event to introduce and to launch a series of the Rio Conventions Pavilion that will be held over the coming nine months. Co-organized by the Secretariats of the Rio Conventions and the Global Environment Facility, the Pavilion serves as a platform to promote and share experience in the implementation of the Conventions in a complementary, integrated and holistic manner towards enhanced and multiple benefits. Now, more than ever, there's an increasing attention being given to integrated approaches in view of the need for such urgent action to introduce the interlinked crises that challenge the future of humanity and the natural world on which our future depends. We hope that the events held in the pavilion, covering a range of issues of common concern to the three conventions, will help to stimulate such action and to achieve their ambition. In today's special event, we shall hear from political and executive heads of the conventions and the Global Environment Facility, who have provided messages dedicated to the occasion, reflecting on the importance for coordinated action. This virtual event will serve as a bridge between the first part of the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity and the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that will open in two and a half weeks' time. So, with that brief introduction, I would like to start the proceedings with messages from the political leadership of these two crucial global conventions. Let me start by introducing His Excellency Huang Rongqiu, Minister of Ecology and Environment of the People's Republic of China and President of the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Diwefang 加强生态系统保护与恢复积极应对气候变化目标承诺促进经济社会发展全面绿色转型深入打好污染防治攻坚战推进三水零田湖草沙冰一体化保护与修复推动各环境公园里约努力为全球可持续发展做出我们积极的贡献科普十五第一阶段会议正在中国会议将就做出积极贡献国际公共资金主渠道的作用 
、生物多样性保护和土地恢复，调动更多的资源。中国愿与国际社会一道密切合作，携手应对气候变化，保护生物多样性，防治土地荒漠化，共建万物和谐的美好家园。Thank you, Your Excellency, for those inspiring words. I would now like to introduce a message from the Right Honourable Lord Goldsmith, Minister of State for Pacific and the Environment of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, speaking on behalf of the President-elect of the 26th meeting of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you. The beauty of protecting and restoring the abundance, diversity, and connectivity of life on Earth is that, in doing so, we're tackling so many other huge challenges that we face. And because there is no credible pathway to any of our shared global goals that does not involve protecting and restoring nature, including net zero, and because we know that nature-based solutions like forests. Mangroves and so on could provide around a third of the most cost-effective solutions we need this decade. The UK is putting nature at the heart of our response to climate change. We're doubling our international climate finance. We're investing at least three billion of that in nature and nature-based solutions for land and sea, and we're urging other donor countries to do similarly. We're designing the conference in Glasgow to help us get ambitious new commitments over the line, including bringing world leaders together to commit further action that will help the world to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by the end of this decade, 2030. And ultimately, as Professor Dasgupta's seminal study makes clear, we need all political and economic decisions to reflect the true value of nature and to count the cost. Properly of its destruction, so we're building alliances of countries committed to shifting perverse agricultural incentives towards sustainability, and to breaking the link between global commodity supply chains and deforestation. We're pressing the multilateral development banks to nature-proof their entire portfolios. We're pulling every lever. To get private finance flowing for nature, from reducing risk to increasing investment. And we're calling for greater recognition, a greater role, and more support for indigenous peoples and local communities, so that they can continue their centuries-long legacy of conservation without fear. Our shared aim must be to bend the curve of biodiversity loss by 2030. And in Kunming, we know we have the basis for agreeing the protection of at least 30% of the world's land and at least 30% of the world's ocean by 2030. The UK is proud to be co-leading those global alliances, and to seeing ecosystems restored, species populations recovering, and extinctions halted by 2050. The framework must be supported by policies and finance that will make those targets a reality, and just as importantly, strengthened reporting and review mechanisms that will hold parties to account for the promises they make. With all three Rio conventions set to meet, we need to make sure that together they add up to more than the sum of their parts. And as the only financing mechanism spanning all three conventions, the GEF has a vital role to play. So we look forward to a successful and ambitious GEF re、uh, replenishment that helps us take coordinated and integrated action across the multilateral environmental agreements. And fulfil the vision of the ambitious Leaders Pledge for Nature to put nature on a road to recovery by 2030. We have all the tools we need to achieve that. We just require the political will and the resources to scale up fast. And in the UK, we're absolutely committed to working with all of you to make that happen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord Goldsmith, for those inspiring remarks. I would now like to turn to the Executive Secretaries of the three conventions. Firstly, I would like to introduce Mr. Ibrahim Tsiao, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Dear friends and colleagues, greetings from the UNCCD. It's a pleasure for me to join the first of a series of activities organized by the Secretariat of the three Rio Conventions, with the support of the Global Environmental Facility, 
in the framework of what has now become a tradition, the Rio Convention Pavilion. Today, we celebrate biodiversity. In three weeks from now, we will celebrate climate action. And in May 2022, we will celebrate land restoration. However, we cannot solve biodiversity loss today, the climate crisis tomorrow, and land restoration the day after. We need to tackle all issues together and as part of a single agenda, one that starts with the environment but goes beyond that and promotes sustainable development for all. The coming months will be critical. It will be crucial to work collectively and coherently to reinforce positive practices at each state. We need to foster collaboration and set up the stage for a new political and investment paradigm that indeed leaves no one behind. And yes, I'm talking about the post-2020 biodiversity framework, major announcements in ambition around the nationally determined contribution at Glasgow, strong and concrete decisions for drought and land restoration at Abidjan. All of that anchored in a strong and coherent eighth replenishment of the GEF, as well as other sources of funding that will allow developing countries to fully implement the conventions and turn the UN decade on ecosystem restoration into a single tangible reality. This sounds daunting, and indeed it might be. We have a few years to emerge from a global tragedy and create a new and lasting transformation on a global scale. We need to achieve a pivotal transformational change in global policy and action related to land, climate change, and biodiversity loss. We need to restore balance with nature seriously and decisively, and we need to do it quickly. The good news is that we are already working on it together. Back in 1992, our predecessors in Rio dared to imagine our challenges ahead as daunting as they were, and provided us with the vision to act collectively to address these challenges and create a better future. I'm confident that we, the UN and its member states, along with stakeholders around the world, will honor that vision and build a clean, green, healthy, safe, sustainable, resilient, and prosperous future for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Executive Secretary. Now, I would like to introduce Ms. Elizabeth Maruma Emrema, Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Arising from the Earth Summit, 30 years ago, the Rio Conventions were established as essential instruments for sustainable development to safeguard the natural world and to ensure the future of humanity. The issues of climate change, desertification, and biodiversity are intimately linked and coordinated approaches to the implementation of the objectives of the three conventions are needed now more than ever. The post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, currently under negotiation, will serve as a universal framework to take really action on all drivers of biodiversity loss. Its success will depend on the implementation of the objectives of all related international organizations and conventions, including our sister Rio conventions. This will require integrated whole of government approaches at national level. It will also rely on actions taken by all stakeholders and all of society. The parties and non-party stakeholders active in the process and in the implementation of the Rio Conventions, including non-governmental organizations, business, women's organizations, youth, indigenous peoples and local communities, academia and research, and subnational and local governments, among others, will play an essential role in actions needed to achieve the goals and targets of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. At the same time, the implementation of the new Global Biodiversity Framework will contribute directly to the objectives 
of the Climate Change Convention, the Paris Agreement on Climate and the Carbon Neutrality, and those of the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, including land degradation neutrality. It will also serve as a framework to foster integrated approaches across conventions and organizations and among all stakeholders. Since its establishment, the Global Environmental Facility has fulfilled an essential role in supporting developing countries to meet their obligations to the Convention on Biological Diversity and its protocols to implement actions for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and to enable the equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the utilization of the genetic resources. The Global Environmental Facility will have a critical role in the implementation of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and in catalyzing the mobilization of resources from all sources, including through mechanisms to enhance domestic financing and redirect harmful subsidies. I will therefore take this opportunity to make a call to all governments for a strong eighth replenishment of the global environment facility. As we start the United Nations Biodiversity Conference here in Kumi, and prepare for the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow and the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification Conference in Cote d'Ivoire next year. Let me conclude with a call for us all to work together to align our vision, our agendas, and our actions for the benefit of the people and the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Secretary. And now I would like to invite Ms. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I am pleased to address these important discussions on biodiversity. Colleagues, next year is the 30th anniversary of the Rio Earth Summit and the formation of our respective conventions on biodiversity, desertification and climate change. And what these three decades have shown us is that our respective roles and mandates are more intertwined than ever before. In June of this year, IPBES and IPCC co-sponsored a workshop report on biodiversity and climate change. The study was the work of 50 of the world's leading biodiversity and climate experts. The report noted that unprecedented changes in climate and biodiversity driven by human activities have combined and increasingly threatened nature, human lives, livelihoods and well-being around the world. It further suggested that biodiversity loss and climate change are both driven by human economic activities and mutually reinforce each other. Neither will be successfully resolved unless both are tackled together. The IPCC report released earlier this summer was also unequivocal in its findings. Recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid and intensifying. These changes are already impacting every region on Earth, both on land and in the oceans. It is now very clear that unless there are immediate, sustained and large-scale reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will be beyond reach. Intensified climate action is needed and it is needed now. Nations must continue stepping up their climate ambition if we are to have any hope of keeping temperatures in check. And in that process, they must protect global biodiversity and our land and ocean resources as well. National Climate Action Plans, or NDCs, as well as National Adaptation Plans, are where nations can and must show integrated action on climate change and biodiversity. The good news 
is that we are seeing some progress. In their NDCs, some countries have begun to systematically link their climate efforts with their CBD targets and policies, as well as with biodiversity-related SDGs. Attention to biodiversity is increasing. Our analysis of NDCs in 2016 indicated about 60% of countries identified biodiversity and ecosystems as an adaptation priority. In the new and updated NDCs received in 2020 and 2021, this number was about 75. This gives it a level of priority comparable to agriculture, health and water resources. We must keep the momentum going. In less than 20 days, the world will meet once again at COP26, the most important set of climate discussions since the Paris Agreement. Success at COP26 is critical not just with respect to meeting our Paris Agreement goals, but also to meeting our SDG deadlines and protecting biodiversity as well. And we need everyone on board. My message to leaders in Glasgow applies to issues related to climate change, but extends throughout the multilateral process on any number of vital issues where collaboration must be the way forward. It's time to re-embrace compromise. Leaders must engage in a frank discussion driven not just by the legitimate desire to protect national interests, but also by the equally commanding goal of contributing to the welfare of humanity. These bold and courageous decisions are what we need to finally implement the Paris Agreement, significantly boost climate ambition, protect our biodiversity, our land, our oceans, and ultimately build a safer, healthier, prosperous, and sustainable world for all. I look forward to working with you to support that work and achieve those results. Thank you. Thank you, Executive Secretary. Finally, I would like to invite the head of the Global Environment Facility that plays such an essential role in the implementation of the three conventions. Mr. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, Chief Executive Officer and a Chair of the Global Environment Facility. It is my great pleasure to be part of this special event today. As a financial mechanism for the Rio Convention and other multilateral agreements, the GEF is uniquely placed to support the shared objectives of the conventions it serves. It is the largest and most experienced multilateral fund dedicated to addressing climate change and threats to nature, working across borders and sectors. Also, based on 30 years of experience, it's increasingly evident that we can and must tackle complex interdependent issues in an integrated manner. Friends and colleagues, the challenge and the choices before us have never been clearer. Without urgent and coordinated action, environmental threats will intensify and harm human development, life foods, and justice in the near term. To ensure a viable future for humanity, we need to change how we produce and consume food and energy, how we build infrastructure in cities, and how we value nature. The GEF is working with our partnered in government, civil societies, and businesses to advance targets and investment plans aligned with the negotiations and agreements of the Rio Convention. We are working to support successful negotiations and to help countries set strong and coherent policies that prioritize a green, blue, clean, resilient future. We are also seeking more resources in JEF-8, our next four-year funding cycle, so that we can have bolder, more ambitious, and scale-up critical needed action to this decade. 
a strong GEF-8 replenishment will support the implementation of the outcome of the forthcoming COPs, including the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Working together, we can help move the world towards a carbon-neutral, nature-positive, and pollution-free future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. That concludes our event. We would like to express our sincere thanks to their Excellencies, Huang Rung Kyu and Lord Goldsmith, the Executive Secretaries of the Conventions, and the Jeff CEO for their inspiring words and commitments to working together for the common objectives of the three conventions. We look forward to welcoming members of our audience to the coming editions of the Real Conventions Pavilion at the Climate COP in Glasgow, in Kunming at Part 2 of CBD COP 15, in Côte d'Ivoire at UNCCD COP 15 in May 2022, and at the Jeff Assembly and Stockholm Plus 50 in June 2022. First up is COP 26, where the Real Conventions Pavilion will be kindly hosted in the joint pavilion of the GEF and GCF. We look forward to welcoming you there. Thank you for your attention.